Welcome to Spiritual Psychology, and I'm here today with Joseph Shumway, a genealogist and ancestral healer, and we're going to talk about ancestral healing. And so what is ancestral healing for you, Joseph? Thanks, Renee. I find ancestral healing work for me as a way for us to identify and heal some of the traumas mm -hmm. um, and the wounds that we have inherited from our ancestors that we have the opportunity to heal by reconnecting with them and reconnecting with some of the ancient earth honoring practice that reground us to our sacred mother earth and finding our place of belonging back in this great interweb of life and interconnection. And so for me, ancestral lineage healing work has been a beautiful way that I've been able to just make internal um, peace with some of the harms and the troubles that my people have both inflicted on others as well as that have been inflicted upon them. And so it's a beautiful way for me as this current incarnate um, version of all of these different ancestral lineages to bring healing and to embody a new face of the wellness and the gifts that those lineages have all had that sometimes just get a little bit lost or scattered along the way. Oh, that's so beautiful. I love um, the correlation with my work in spiritual psychology. I love hearing different language around this kind of um, just natural healing process that I think has always been available to all people, which is to find our place in this web of life, both historically and going for in however we understand the time space continuum, right? And, right, right. and through connecting with the spirit of the earth and the elements, which for me is always the most easily accessible doorway to connect with the larger consciousness system and to find our unique place in how we can be hopefully in the healing end rather than the harm end of, right. uh, of the human of the human story that's beautiful so how do you work with ancestral healing with people or in your own discovery of yourself i find for me i take an approach as a genealogist um helping people kind of get a basic lay of the land of their mm -hmm. family tree. I find that to be very useful and helpful. I don't necessarily think it's necessity to conduct genealogical research and have this vast understanding of your family tree, but I do find that some basic understanding of where in the, in the world do some of your lineages have some historical connections mm -hmm. and are there perhaps some easily identifiable points where trauma has either been incurred upon the lineage or mm -hmm. where the lineage has participated in a larger story of harm, right. which is then secondary trauma on the bodies of those ancestors that then passes down as well. So I find helping people get a general feel for their, their family tree is very useful because then as we go into the work, we have a sense of where may some of the more trouble spots be in the tree that we need to mm -hmm. keep an eye out for? And where, what may be some of the ancient um, cultures that your people were a part of, some of those ancient, more earth honoring cultures? Mm -hmm. And those are what I find very beautiful to then, as we go through this process of the healing work, helping people to reconnect and reclaim even if it's just some of the practices of their ancestors were ancient Celts or Norsemen or what, wherever their lineages may be, it, it, being able to like learn about some of those ancient cultures and then reconnect and reintegrate with some of those practices that then can be portals to the earth connection that can then just bring so much extra healing into the body and the soul. What's beautiful about that approach of, of connecting with the ancestral connections, the positive ancestral connections that exist for all of us, whether, whether we understand the specific practices or even 
just the ecosystems or environments that our ancestors might have lived in. For example, my ancestors um, came from Wales. Some of them, of course, there's many, many places they came mm -hmm. from. And I didn't find that out until after I had visited Wales. And when mm. I was only there for a couple of days in this adorable little village called Conwy, and I felt so connected there. I thought it was the most beautiful place. And then I found out through my own ancestral lineage work, very similar to what you're talking about, of, of like looking at what were the places and spaces that my ancestors lived in. And are any of even my preferences for forest or desert or ocean maybe linked to those? And it was really interesting Um for me, that was one of my first, before I even began working shamanically with people with elements. Um, mm. And now when I bring people, even people, I work with a lot of adoptees. I work with African-American people who, you know, have certainly interrupted lineage. And when we go to connect with nature and the spirits of nature, it's really beautiful to see where they're often led to like ancestral lands. Yes. Uh, ancestral places. Um, and to reconnect with, you know, great, great grandmother or some, you know, jaguar or some other spirit um, that has been connected with their ancestors that they can then connect with. And it's so grounding and healing, um, I think, for all of us to be to rem to be reminded that we're part of the Earth family. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Even aside absolutely. from our. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I love how every client that I work with and walk through this process has their own unique experience. And it's just, it's always confirming and reassuring of just like the fact that we're really tapping into a real place of consciousness in the in the outer realm. Like the, 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 and just, it's, it's beautiful to see um, a person as I hold space for them and kind of guide them through a journey to experience, they'll start to see images come to mind or certain animals or certain plants or whatnot that'll like kind of surface and come to mind. And it's just always fun, like after the session and through some of the follow-up um, research and, and, and work that they do, they'll find, oh, this plant was really important for people in this land or this animal was really sacred to this culture. And so it, it's just always fun to see those elements pop up because those affinity spirits recognize them as part of those lineages that held that relationships. Right. That, and, and I'm sure you have come to understand, like I do that the spirit world is real, <laughs> <laughs> even if it doesn't make sense intellectually, like there's a, there's a correlation, there are serendipities, there are overlaps or crossover into ordinary reality that is really benevolent and helpful and beneficial. And we can tap into that um, for our own benefit and for the benefit of the people that we work with. Right. And so how do you bring people to those places? So I start with clients and assessing um, what I call the four primary lineages. So in the modality of work that I do, we focus on, um, like I said, the four primary lineages, which are your two paternal grandfathers and your two maternal, or your sorry, your your paternal grandfather lineages and your maternal grandmother lineages. Okay. So we have um, the direct male lineage of your father's father, mm -hmm. the direct maternal lineage of your father's mother, right. the direct paternal lineage of your mother's father, and then your mother's mother's lineage. So these are the lineages that have the most impact on a body and soul level that mm -hmm. I have found. So I start by assessing, helping the client drop into an embodied state and just listening in. We're not making contact with any ancestors at this point. It's just listening into the body as our intuitive instrument and sensing mm -hmm. what are the state of these lineages? Are they pretty well and vibrant? Is there a lot of good energy there? Or is there some murkiness? Is there some trouble there that, that you're sensing? So we assess kind of what's going on in the lineage and then also how much that lineage impacts that person on a body level. Because if there's a lot of 
strange, weird energy from a particular lineage and the client's feeling like, oh, this really impacts me. Like, oh, I got some, I've got some people up in my space, you know, right. then we first, before we can really start the work, we need to create some boundaries. We need to ask all of these lineages that are kind of ghosty and up in the space. We need to create some boundaries and have them take a step back. It's a very loving boundary because we're going to help mm -hmm. work through the troubles, but we can't do that if we've got interference. So that's one of the first things that we do. And then I help the clients listen into which of those four lineages feels most important to start the process of reconnection and healing with. So we'll take it one lineage at a time. And a lot of times a client feels to go where they weren't expecting. So a lot of times people will come in and like, my dad's side is a mess. There's all kinds of trouble there, et cetera. I need to work on that. But what's interesting is most of the time when we step into the embodied state and listen, they actually feel, oh, I actually need to work with my mom's side first. I was, you know, where it doesn't feel like there's as much trouble, for instance. And that's always beautiful because when we can reconnect with some of the ancestors on that lineage, we're bringing in resourcing that is then needed and helpful to then eventually turn to where some of the more trouble is. So um, as we start that reconnection process, the goal is to reconnect with ancestors on these lineages mm -hmm. who had experience living in what we would consider an intact culture. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes for folks with European ancestries, we have to go back a long ways before recorded history and names even to find that ancestor who lived in a culture where they were earth connected, where they were connected to their communities, their peoples, mm -hmm. where they were just able to live well and die well, if you, mm -hmm. if you will. Right. And so that yeah. there's an unbroken connection with the ancestors so that when they pass, they're able to be integrated well into, into the afterlife. And then we get this separation period where there's a lot of folks who have died without having that right. ability to properly transition. That's where we get this breakage. So right. we're connecting with ancestors with that experience. And then we're letting them kind of hold the work. We're letting them tell us and teach us what do we carry that then needs to be re, um, repaired. Mm. And we seek their guidance on how to repair that. What are offerings I can make? What are practices I can incorporate into my daily life? What are some gifts? Maybe I could start cultivating. What are some organizations that maybe I can reach out to and offer my, my, my help, my volunteer efforts, or you know whatever it is that they want that person to do to help bring that repair? Because we're repairing our bodies and our souls, but because we're so connected with all of the ancestors, when we start to do that healing work ourselves, it reverberates out Absolutely. through the lineage. And then eventually um, that guide, we call them, mm -hmm. they see to it that everybody in that lineage is kind of gathered up, however they, they go about it, bring all of that healing energy through. And so that we eventually have this direct connection through the entire lineage that can then bring all of this good energy into our own bodies that we can step forward and really be the face of the well beauty that all human beings were meant to embody. We've just had a lot of trouble for a long time that makes it a little bit difficult for us to sometimes really step into our power and to the gifts that really need to show up as medicine in where we are today. Wow. So the way I see it is you're finding an anchor back in the lineage that's healthy. And, and the person mm -hmm. who is here is, we're going to say a healthy anchor on this end. And then it's about helping to, I don't know if we want to use the word clear so much, but, but reattune the ancestral lineage that's in between that and bring healing so that there's this more clear connection back with that place that you want to ground with through all yes. the difficulties that happen. Oh, that's really beautiful. Yeah. And the thing that I love about that approach is that we don't have to be the ones to know how to fix yes. 
very troubled great great grandmother great 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 grandfather that had so much trauma we don't have to be the ones to know what to do for them the ancient guide is the one that whatever's needed for that ancestor if there's some soul retrieval work they're going to go do it they're going to do the things and we're just holding the space we're sending up the prayers we're making the offerings we're making shifts and changes in our personal lives and relationships that's then building that healing energy that the guide uses I like to think of it that they're using all of that energy we're putting out there to then help pull everybody together into this beautiful woven lineage of wellness. Wow. That is really awesome work, Joseph. <laughs> That's really, really <laughs> impressive. Um, I'm wondering how you create those gentle boundaries and help people create those gentle boundaries. That that feels like something that is like helpful right away. I, I love that because we can always feel like, oh, my father's financial issues and the addiction from my mother's father's mm -hmm. side and the pressure to be codependent from my mother's grandmother and the hoarding. You know, I get all four of them. I know what they are. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, so how do you create those gentle boundaries so that we can be our own embodied present person and then, you know, maybe and just even see how we want to even work with those things? Yeah, I I'll, always generally will start off by helping the client, like identify what are your trusted powers and sources of strength? And sometimes people already come with other spirit guides or deities that they work with regularly or simply just calling on the energy of Mother Gaia, you know, can sometimes just be whatever the greater power a person finds. I always call that power in with them to kind of just hold space and to be there as a support as we drop into just this embodied state. And then when we're creating the boundaries, I always have that person use that greater power that's holding that space for them to create the boundary. Um, and just gently just asking that, that one, that being who's there present, holding that space for them. Can you just help my grandmother's lineage people just to take a step back and just, and sometimes they'll listen. They're like, Oh, they're having a hard time. They don't want to let go. And so it's like, okay, let's listen and call in some other resources who, you know, let's, let's call in well ancestors that maybe you don't even know about yet that we're going to get to. So we can call in other sources of power and support to finally might make that again. It's just a step back because we, we need to help these folks heal for our own healing. So it's just this loving boundary step back. And it's just so beautiful when people feel for the first time, maybe in their lives, like this clarity. And, and sometimes I always help people draw attention to the body because the somatic experience is really important with what's going on in the body as some of these shifts start to take place. And so it's so fun to see like people like, oh, my neck just popped weird. Whoa. <laughs> and they can really feel just a, a, a release of something. And yeah, mm -hmm. we're still going to go through that work, but that boundary setting is so important and crucial. And we do that by calling on support from other sources and powers that, that we rely on and trust. So I'm curious about, so I see this happen all the time with people, you know, particularly as an American, I work with, everybody's an immigrant. Right. And everybody has an immigrant story and there's generally immigration trauma of one form or another, whatever color you happen to be, you know, whether yes. you're leaving the Irish famine or escaping the Armenian genocide or, you know, there's all there's all this. Rah. So. How do you understand if there is even the right way to say this? How do you understand this ancestral, I want to call it pressure or expectation. Like that that's okay. the thing I see is the ancestors generally, whether it's their own unresolved trauma that they're projecting forward, just like we do onto what we can easily do onto our children and our friends. Like, you know, I was raped in college. I don't want my friend to get raped in college. So every time she goes out on a date, I'm like, oh, watch out for the guy. You know, th that, yeah. um, or 
just that energy. How do you understand how that reverberates into us in present time from the from the ancestral lineages? I think it's it can be different for every person. Um, even if you have ancestors who had who have experienced trauma during the Irish famine exodus, for instance, you may not have yourself inherited some of the specific traumas that you know about in your family tree. Mm -hmm. And so what I often do is when we're going through that process of reconnecting with these ancestor guides that I call them, mm -hmm. I oftentimes help the client really rely on that guide to help them mm. understand what are the troubles in this particular lineage, what's coming up. And then it's so potent to listen to that guide. And then the client will oftentimes be, oh, wow, I'm, I'm seeing this. I'm feeling this. There's a separation from their homeland. Oh, wow. There's I feel like there's a fire that killed a lot of people. Like they'll just sense the things. And then it's, okay, what do you carry of that? And then it's interesting for that client to then, in their own words, find what are they carrying that connects to that. Um, so I oftentimes take it on an individual basis, lineage at a time and listening. And sometimes people... Um, I mentioned that first initial state that I take people through this kind of assessment. Oftentimes people in that very first place, as they're kind of listening into each of these lineages, well, they'll start to get a sense like, oh, I'm carrying this. Oh, I think this comes from this lineage. And I didn't even know it came from a lineage, but I've been dealing with, you know, an addiction or whatever it is for a long time. And I think it's connected to this. So sometimes people can just start to feel and sense where things are connected. And then we always just take it back to those wise, loving guides to help us understand those better. And when we're attuning with the guides, we, we not only learn about the troubles connected with the lineage, but we learn about the blessings and the gifts. Yes. The blessings and the gifts are the medicine for the troubles. Right. And so by learning what those are and how the, the person can incorporate those, that's going to then fuel that that healing and repair on the, the body and soul level and then reverberate throughout the lineage. I love the direct connection with the blessings and the gifts. Mm -hmm. And that, I think... <clears throat> just even to come off of the ancestral conversation for a minute. And I think I was talking with someone yesterday who's really struggling with self-criticism. And, and I was telling her that I, I actually am free of that today after the work, lots and lots of work <laughs> that I don't have mm -hmm. an inner critic anymore. And how she said, well, you know, is there anything I can do? And I said, so focus on the things you're doing right rather than the things that you're doing that you would consider wrong, mm -hmm. right? Like, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. and so <clears throat> this focus often, so often we focus on what's wrong. Yes. Rather than um, really, it can even be challenging to focus on what's right because there can be habits and ancestral habits as well of just worrying and being, looking for what's the problem and, and, the attunement I love and I'm gonna I'm gonna ask the attunement with the higher wisdom of the guides of um Budaic or celestial consciousness or earth the higher realms right of of these more mm -hmm. positive how um how do you help people attune I love that term um because I think as humans, we all have a natural ability to attune to other people. And sometimes it's, yes. we can we can attune down if we listen to the news and we can get into anxiety yeah. and fear and worry and hopelessness. Um, or we can attune up into like joy and openness and hope and courage, right? So mm -hmm. how do you help people attune? The biggest thing for me is helping a person learn to be in their body. And 
using the body as this intuitive instrument that it's intended to be. And so oftentimes with the person, when I help guide them into an embodied state so that we can journey, we got to take some time to like move out of this headspace that we get so uh, caught up in, in our culture these days. And we really have to move that awareness down into the lower body and really feel that groundedness calling up the energy from the earth to help us like really plant down. And then when we can quiet the mind, quiet the ego a little bit and just start to listen, I find that's the most effective way to help people then attune to some of these other um, sources of wisdom and being able to interpret and give language to Mm. what's coming into the body then. And then, that headspace being cleared of all of the chit chat, I can bring that attunement energy up, you know, through, I find for myself and a lot of folks, it's like, I, I feel in my gut, this information and just kind of gently services. And then it's like, Oh, okay. And now I can put language to it. Now I can make sense of the images that are flashing on, on the screen of the mind or whatnot. And so really using the body as a way to attune is a, an effective way for myself and that I, I help clients as well. Because there's so much information available to us in these non-rational, more physical and body centered ways of knowing and gathering information that, that are often dismissed as irrational. And I like to call them non-rational because they're just a different way of knowing. Yes. Um, that a lot of us don't, a lot of us have, I mean, all humans have that, right? But we aren't practiced at it because we're taught to spend so much time in our head. In fact, in school, we're kind of told to get out of our body because we, if our body's uncomfortable sitting at a desk all day, we're told to ignore it just so we can be up in our head. Yeah, yeah for sure. How do you help people ground? Do you have any practices for that that would be helpful for people listening? I find when it's new for folks that it is so helpful to have the guidance of a, of a practitioner or some kind of a guided meditation or whatnot, and just to gently help people learn to first start calming their breath and then gently bringing attention to different parts of the body. I always start at the top of the head because that's where we've got the most energy buzzing around and going on. And so like just bringing attention to here that's easy to do. And then just gently and slowly helping people move to the jaw. Tension there, hmm, let's relax it. The neck, shoulders, what do you think? Tension there, yeah, let's relax it. And just very slowly moving people down each part of the body. And eventually when we get to the feet, I like to then help them invite the earth energy to come up and to greet them and to meet them. And now that they've hopefully kind of calmed and cleared down to the feet, they can start to more easily feel that beautiful sensation of that nourishing energy coming up through the earth to just kind of fill that that space. And then bringing it back up to the top of the head, um, just gently from the feet on back. And then that's just kind of a, a common practice that I do with folks is just using that body and drawing attention to each part and as we notice each part, it just does something on that deeper level that we just start to give some attention to. And that part of the body kind of speaks out to us and like, hey, I'm here, yay, you notice me. And it's like, I don't know, it just finds that this, this natural calming effect that can just come to then create that space where we can then attune and listen and sense what's coming through. And it's so fun when I work with folks who are new, to spiritual work in general and they're not sure what to expect they're a little skeptical or whatnot and it's so often the case that they're like they're in their journey journey state and there's images coming to mind there's things are like i don't know i'm making this up i gotta be making this up and i always love to help people assure them like you don't make things up like when you see something on your mind's screen or the image, like that thought is already multiple steps ahead in the process of getting to you. And so learning to help them listen to that intuition is really beautiful. And then when they can start to see see things that are like validate their experience of sensing, 
mm-hmm. is really fun and rewarding. That's my favorite part of the work is when they're like, I couldn't make this up. There's no way. Like <laughs> when they find something out that m- matches what they learn later or whatever it is. And I'm curious. So you mentioned that you're in Utah. Yes. And I've actually had a couple of clients from the Mormon tradition, Mm -hmm. both in both intrinsic in it and rejected from it and different Mm -hmm. relationships with it. And it's, it's a particularly powerful institution um, that has a lot of lineage and, and uh, attachment to lineage in it. And so I'm wondering about institutional pressure or institutional mm-hmm. resistance or institutional how how that fits in um having worked particularly with the Catholic Church historically through my own lineage and and in the lineage of many of the people in the Irish Catholic community that I've had the opportunity to work with um that there's an institutional ancestry or an institutional energy that's often under-recognized. Um, and I'm just curious about what your experience, or if you have anything to say about kind of institutional energies in the yes. world. I love, I love this question. Um, so I grew up in the Mormon faith um, and my ancestors have been a part of the Mormon faith since its founding in upstate New York in the 1830s. And so I have a deep history there. And, you know, as a gay person, there's a lot of trauma for myself growing up in that institution uh, with that identity and struggling to understand and everything. So my own journey is a little bit of a separate story, but when I started the ancestral healing work, it was very beautiful because I already had a good knowledge of my ancestors because as you mentioned, it's very important in the Mormon faith to, to know your ancestors and there's all kinds of spiritual practices that go with that, but they're kind of shallow. And so it was really beautiful when I started working with my own lineages, I learned that some of my Mormon ancestors weren't as well as I thought they were at, at growing up. And particularly my uh, my female ancestors mm-hmm. um, and some of my other queer ancestors that I learned about through the process of going through that there was a lot of institutional entanglement here. Mm-hmm. And I found for myself that as I listened with these new beautiful ancestor guides on these lineages who were helping me kind of make sense of things that I was carrying from the lineages, the most beautiful thing that helped me kind of heal and disentangle some of these larger energies Mm -hmm. was reclaiming the earth honoring practices Mm -hmm. of the lineage. Mm -hmm. And so as I started learning about uh, um, most of my ancestors are Welsh. And so as I started learning about the Celtic traditions and the the, the religious, the spiritual practices um, and incorporating some of those, it was so healing for me to find a new place for my spiritual inklings to land. Because mm-hmm. I'd always been a spiritual person. And so when I left Mormonism, it was hard because I felt like I still wanted some of this, the, the connection that I felt on that deep soul level, but I didn't know where to put it Mm -hmm. in a sense. You know, I didn't believe in the same white skinned, white bearded male God that I had grown up believing in. And so where do I put that? So reconnecting with some of the ancient spiritual connections of my ancestors was really healing for me. And it started to reverberate up through these lineages and those ancestors that I had had who never got that experience started to love it as well and finding joy and learning and reconnecting with the traditions that they were learning, however they were learning it in the other realms. Right. <laughs> you know, I, I could feel that joy kind of just move up through the lineage as I was kind of reclaiming some of these, these practices that were then regrounding me to the earth and the natural cycles and the interconnectedness of this life web. Um, so that was a really powerful thing for me to do. I have also worked with many clients that have deep, you know, Catholic um, 
ancestries. And I had plenty of my own before Mormonism came along. But I, I, for myself, I find that my ancestors were really excited to reconnect with some of the, the, the ancient, the, the more pagan traditions of the, of the cultures. But I've had clients whose ancestors had real affinities with the Virgin Mary mm-hmm. or, uh, or with Yeshua of Nazareth, not Jesus, of Yeshua of Nazareth. And so it's been interesting sometimes as I work with people, they're, they're so set on wanting to just distance themselves from Christianity as a whole because of the, the troubles that have been there. But then when they sense that, you know what, my ancestors, they want me to look into something here. Uh, and they reluctantly then learn that, oh, there's a whole other side of beautiful spirituality and earth connection with Yeshua and the Magdala and Mary, Virgin Mary. And so learning to kind of reframe Christianity for some people has been very helpful as well to kind of just let go of the institutional harm right. and the energies that have accompanied that. Long answer to your question, but- No, no, um, it's a big question. Yeah, it it's is, a big it question. Is. Absolutely. No, it is a big question. And I think, you know, the term mystical practice, which really means direct connection with spirit or the divine or the higher energies. Um, they don't have to be higher. I don't, there's, you know, words are difficult when you talk about spirituality, right? Because yeah. anyway, it's not really up or down, or, <laughs> but <laughs> connecting with benevolent, loving, compassionate, healing, wise forces that are available to all of us in a direct way. And, you know, the, a lot of, people's experience with institutions has been um, a more fear-based or that the, that there was some corruption, a human corruption within the institution itself, separate from the spiritual realizations or power that was the source of it, that does exist in there somewhere, in every tradition, right? Right, right but it's often covered up by other people's misunderstandings or their own selfishness or their own fears or their own trauma that's unresolved that they're projecting out onto other people that then becomes an institutional thing that other people suffer. Right. So I, I mean, I think most people have institutional trauma on, on some level or another. Right. And to be able, the sad thing that I see, um, the sad thing that also has the medicine in it is a turning away from mystic from spiritual connection because of the difficulties. And it seems to often for many people bring more suffering than it does good. But then the medicine is to reconnect with source in whatever way it wants to make itself known to us. And that connection is the medicine. We all need connection and right. we need connection with each other. We need connection with ourselves, but we also need connection with the larger consciousness system, however we understand it. And it is often surprising um, as I work, you know, bringing people in inner journey work to connect with guides and teachers, their own higher self, however it will present. And people are often dismayed at first that like Jesus and Mary showed up or Muhammad showed up and they don't want to, you know, but it shows up in a way that is, you. it's ancestral almost. It's like that shows up in this loving, benevolent, very direct way that offers wisdom and healing that they can attune to that there's a mystery um, mm-hmm. that heals those institutional sufferings and allows us to have compassion for them. It does. Yeah, I totally agree. And that's an important part of that healing journey is is eventually landing in a place where we can understand with compassion after we have been able to grieve and and move through that process of healing and then let it go and move into this state where we can now, like you said, hold that compassion. Um, And that's a beautiful place to ultimately land because we're then in a place where we are so much more connected to these other beautiful mystical beings on the other side, as well as where we are in the present and how we can show up now as this more healed, vibrant version of ourselves. Yes. Yes. Within this larger fabric. I mean, that's, I think, Mm -hmm. 
again, it's challenging to talk about and intellectually, it doesn't make sense. Um, this idea that many of the great spiritual traditions and modern teachers even talk about that time is uh, not a linear thing that space it's, you know, I mean, uh, Einstein, talked about it in his own mathematical approach that like there's a mystery of time and space and it is my experience like it is yours that when we work with the ancestral realms there however it happened however it works they're still in process as well and our healing helps them to heal and there is this continuum um, of process happening that we're participating in. And so our work is beneficial to the whole system. Right. Yeah. I love that. So you have an excellent offering for people. So why don't you tell them about that? If they want to do some work on their own. Yeah. I offer a free mini introductory course um, about ancestral healing and reconnection work um, that they can sign up for on my website. And what I do is I walk people through what I call the, are the four sacred connections mm -hmm. that are important to healing. And that's reconnecting to the body, like we've talked about, learning mm -hmm. to use it as an intuitive instrument, connect with our ancestors, and then connecting with the earth and our larger community that we're involved with. And as we work to connect with those four things, we start to build momentum of healing and wholeness. And so my introductory course just kind of walks people through the basics of that. I'm also available if people feel called to dive in uh, to the deeper work of ancestral healing. They're welcome to reach out if they feel that I'm a practitioner that can meet their needs. Awesome. And how would they get in touch with you? It'll be in the show notes as well, but. Yeah. So my website is josephbshumway.com. And they're just right on the homepage. They can find where they can sign up for the free course or they can learn about my other offerings and reach out to me through the website as well. Awesome. So if you liked this video, please subscribe and like it so that more people will get to see it. And check out Joseph's free course on ancestral healing. And if you moved, reach out to him. I'm also doing a workshop this Saturday, November 18th on ancestral healing it's a half day workshop um, from noon to four eastern and nine to one pacific and we're going to be looking a deep dive not dissimilar to the work that joseph is talking about to connect with our own body to connect with protective earth and spirit guide energies and then to work with our own ancestral lines and honor the gifts that they give us and to separate from the things that we no longer want to carry forward or don't benefit us and bring some healing back to them as well. So there'll be a link to my workshop as well. So lots of ancestral resources in the video today. And Joseph, thank you so much. It was lovely to talk to you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me, Renee. And blessings on your work. Thank you. You as well. And maybe we'll talk again. Absolutely. We'd love it. All right. Thank you, dear. Goodbye. Bye now.